Good evening, everyone. With the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Food, please come to order. Before the committee can proceed with the business before it, it must elect a chairperson. Are there any nominations? Uh, Minister Johnson. I nominate MLA Wishart. Mr. Wishart has been nominated. Any other nominations? Hearing none, Mr. Wishart, please take the chair. Our next item of business is select a vice chairperson. Are there any nominations? Minister Johnson? I nominate MLA Cox. MLA Cox has been nominated. Are there any uh, other nominations? Hearing no other nominations, MLA Cox is elected vice chairperson. This meeting has been called to consider Bill number 22, the Environment Amendment Act Pesticide Restrictions. I'd like to inform all in attendance of the provisions of our rules regarding the hour of adjournment. A standing committee meeting to consider a bill must not sit past midnight to hear public presentations or to consider clause by clause of the bill except by unanimous con consent of the committee. For written submissions, written submissions for the following members have been received and distributed to the committee. Dennis Volkoff, Association of Manis Manitoba Municipalities. Joanne Seff, Private Citizen. Murray Cunningham, Environmental Health Association of Manitoba. And Ben Rabber, Private Citizen. Does the committee agree to have this document appear in Hansard transcript of the, me the meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. Prior to proceeding with the public presentations, I'd like to advise members of the public regarding the process for speaking in committee. In accordance with our rules, a time limit of 10 minutes has been allocated for presentation with another five minutes allowed for questions from, this committee, from committee members. Questions from members must not exceed 30 seconds in length with no time limit on the answers. Questions must be addressed to the presenter in the following rotation First, the minister sponsoring the bill. Second, a member of the official op op opposition. And third, an independent member. If a presenter is not in attendance when the name is called, they will be dropped to the bottom of the list. If the presenter is not in attendance when their name is called the second time, they will be removed from the presenter's list. The proceedings of our meetings are recorded in order to pr uh, provide a verbatim verbatim transcript. Each time someone wishes to speak, whether it is an MLA or a presenter, I first must call that person's name. This is a signal for the Hansard recorder uh, to turn the mics on and off. Hearing presentations. Your list is, just the list is over here somewhere. Isn't it? Okay. I will now call on Margaret Friesen, private citizen. Minister Johnston. Order, were we going to maybe decide on um, rotations? Possibly we could have consideration for in person, out of town presenters to present first. Is there agreement to consider that? Okay. Um, we will vary the order then by and, uh, calling first any in-person, out-of-town presenters, if there are any. See, seeing none, identifying themselves, we will. Yeah, um, we'll revert to the order as presented here. Okay, going back to where we were, uh, Margaret Friesen, Friday private citizen as first presenter. Okay. Not seeing her in, in uh, attendance. She will drop to the bottom of the list. We'll move on and she'll be called again when we get to that point. Uh, second person on the list is Shirley Forsyth, private citizen. I'll call again Shirley Forsyth, private citizen. 
No one here coming forward. Drop to the bottom of the list, and we'll be called again at that point. Yeah. yeah. Third person on the list is, is Katharina Steffenhofer, private citizen. Call again. They will be called again. Okay, we will continue down the list. Uh, fourth person is Ann Lindsay, private citizen. She's here. Oh. She's here? Is it, we're in agreement to uh, revert to point of order, Ms. Mr. Minister. Continue, continue uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, recognize him. Mr. Wharton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we were calling Ann Lindsay, and I think we should uh, continue with calling Ann Lindsay. I believe she's here. Okay, well, we, we will revert back uh, at, at due course. So currently we're calling Ann Lindsay, private citizen. Ann Lindsay, thank you for coming. Are you ready to make your presentation? Begin your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me uh, here and the opportunity to present this evening. Um, I am a member of the coalition known as Cosmetic Pesticide Ban Manitoba. We are a group of um, uh, volunteer representatives from environmental and health organizations from around the province. We work actively towards reducing unnecessary chemical exposure from, chemical, uh, from cosmetic pesticides. I would like to note um, a letter that we sent to ministers Horton and Gordon um, endorsed by more than 30 prominent health and environmental groups, including the Manitoba College of Physicians, the Winnipeg Humane Society, Learning Disabilities Association of Manitoba, Manitoba Health Coalition, David Suzuki Foundation, and so on. More than three months ago on this topic, we have not received a response. My main focus this evening will be on human health, and I understand that others will speak to impacts on ecosystems and water. So my personal first awareness of cosmetic pesticides was when my children were very young, so we're going back 40 years. It's not something that we used at our home, but we started to notice they were being used on things like soccer fields in parks. We also noticed a strong odor in neighborhoods after chemical trucks were spraying. At the same time, we were becoming aware of mosquito fogging, the chemicals used on food products, um, and in air pollutants. And as a conscientious young parent, I wanted to ensure the safest possible environment for my children, so we tried to avoid chemicals when we did not have to be exposed to them. Didn't have a lot of information back then, but I had an inherent sense that we were surrounded by a lot of chemicals. Once I started work in the environmental movement at the Manitoba Eco Network, I started to become more aware. I um, was exposed to experts, various uh, NGOs, and different policy work at the provincial, national, and international level that indicated that the miraculous chemicals that we've all become so accustomed to using in everyday life had lots of undesired impacts on health and ecosystems. This included pesticides being used to keep lawns and green space weed free. I hope the committee members have taken the time to consult research on this and I'm going to give one example. The Ontario College of Family Physicians in 2012 did a systemic review of pesticide health effects. They reviewed hundreds of studies and concluded that exposure to pesticides is strongly linked to a wide variety of human health problems, and I'm going to name them, including um, adverse reproductive, neurological, and respiratory outcomes, uh, Parkinson's disease, asthma, obstructive lung disease, ALS, diabetes, and some cancers. I name them because who amongst us has not had a family member or friend who's been affected by these illnesses? Who's most at risk? Amongst other groups are children. Both prenatal exposures and exposures in the early years can lead to birth defects, learning disorders, and certain cancers. These facts alone mean that restrictions and bans on cosmetic pesticides should be a no-brainer. The Ontario College concluded that unnecessary pesticide exposure should be avoided 
and that echoes Health Canada in their 2007 publication, and I quote, it is good practice to reduce or eliminate any unnecessary exposure to pesticides, unquote. I want to emphasize that these chemicals are unnecessary by nature. They are used for purely aesthetic purposes. And we know that green space and lawns can be created and maintained without the use of chemicals. At the Eco Network, we developed educational programs to assist people who wanted to keep their lawns and green space looking nice without the use of chemicals. Hundreds, if not thousands, of people took those workshops. They were able then to reduce their family's um, exposure, but unfortunately, when restrictions don't exist, individuals may not use them, but families are still exposed in their neighborhoods, parks, and so on. People breathe in these chemicals when they walk to school, when they spend time outside. This is why restrictions on sale and use are so important. Municipalities led the way on this issue. The town of Hudson in Quebec in 1991 had a bylaw restricting chemical, uh, the use of cosmetic pesticides. They were challenged by two big corporations, Chemlon and Spraytech, which said they didn't have the right to pass such a bylaw. However, every court, up to the Supreme Court of Canada, agreed with Hudson that they had every right to protect the health and welfare of their citizens. And this became a landmark ruling in Canada. More municipalities followed and then provinces. Manitoba was late to the game, but in 2014, we joined the majority of Canadians under protection from cosmetic pesticides. So we've benefited from six years of cleaner, healthier, healthier environments here. As far as I know, Manitoba would be the first jurisdiction to roll back such um, restrictions if Bill 22 passes. This is a major move backwards. And it's a great shame. It puts people and ecosystems at risk. I just want to address a couple of points that seem to be driving this legislation. The first one is to do with costs. And I'm aware of the lobbying by rural municipalities about how much more it costs them to maintain green space. Um, in fact, the Canadian Association of Physicians for Environment conducted a study a few years back now um, looking at municipalities in different jurisdictions under cosmetic pesticide bans, and they found that none of them were spending significantly more to maintain acceptable green spaces. I'm wondering if committee members have asked themselves, what are the costs to healthcare system from the potential outcomes of exposure to these chemicals? They are hard to quantify for sure, but inevitably they will be much higher to society at large. And what about the heartache, stress, and loss to families? when cancers and neurodevelopmental problems arise. Should we be known as the province that puts the aesthetics of weed-free lawns ahead of people's health? Not to mention the impacts on animals, ecosystems, and waterways, which some of the other presenters will be addressing. The second piece that seems to be commonly touted by the government is Health Canada's approval of use of cosmetic pesticide as directed by the label. I just want to draw your attention to some other submissions that call, uh, speak to the inadequacies of the pest management regulatory agency's process. Briefly, it is risk-based. That means PMRA decides whether the risks of exposure are acceptable. They don't say it's safe. Surely determination of risk is something that families can decide. Second, they rely primarily on industry studies. They don't consider the impacts of the chemical soup that I mentioned earlier, the fact that chemicals, cosmetic pesticide chemicals don't exist outside of all the other chemicals that we're constantly exposed to. And third, they have a strong history of withdrawing approvals when new information comes out. And that means that people have spent years being exposed to these chemicals before the approval has been withdrawn. I just want to repeat in conclusion that caution from Health Canada, quote, it is good practice to reduce or eliminate any unnecessary exposure to pesticides, unquote. Bill 22, if passed, will do the opposite. It will increase exposure to unnecessary pesticides. Quite simply, more people will be harmed. I and the Cosmetic Pesticide Ban Manitoba Coalition strongly urge that Bill 22 be withdrawn. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Ann Lindsay, for your presentation. Um, I would remind members of the committee before we uh, call for questions that the questions are in the following rotation. Minister sponsoring the bill, member of the official opposition, and independent member. Are there questions for Ms. Lindsay? Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Lindsay, for coming down tonight. Really appreciate uh, you providing us uh, the information that obviously you and your organization work hard at uh, every single day, and certainly we appreciate that. That's why democracy and that's why committee is so important that we can understand from, uh, from regular Manitobans exactly what their feelings are as we go forward uh, providing uh, policy and legislation for, for, for the betterment of Manitobans. Um, one question I did have for you is, and you made a comment near your closing about risk is, is, is something that families can and should decide. Um, I think we agree with that comment, definitely. Uh, we know that we're dealing with uh, um, uh, a federally approved product. I know that uh, you had cited some areas that uh, were in conflict of that. Um, you also talked about uh, you also talked about um, uh, some other issues with the federal requirements. Um, could you maybe highlight some of the areas again that you heard from the okay. federal side that are contradictive of the 350 scientists that say uh, that cosmetic pesticides are safe? Ms. Lindsay, and a reminder to those asking questions, 30 seconds to ask Your questions. Your question, Minister. Um, Thank you. I would just like to contradict your final oh. comment that Health Canada does not say that pesticides are I'll safe. Get it that way. In fact, I think it might even be illegal to say that pesticides are safe, but I don't quote me on that. Um, sure, they have a lot of scientists at the PMRA. Um, as noted, they take a risk based um, approach, which means they decide for us what is the acceptable risk when uh, using chemicals that they're approving. To my mind, if there is a risk as highlighted by the many physicians that are part of the Ontario College of Family Physicians, of any of the illnesses and diseases that I spoke about, my choice would be to say for an unnecessary exposure, I won't take that risk. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. MLA Naylor. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate your comments and I appreciate all the work that you've done in the community on this important issue. Um, you, uh, you closed with a quote, uh, or just towards the end, you, there was a quote, I believe it was from Health Canada. I just wanted to clarify that. Could you repeat that quote again for the record? I just wanted to hear that in full. Sorry, my my error. Uh, MLA, or sorry, uh, Miss Lindsay, please go ahead. Oh, I'm so, okay. Um, yes, the quote. Uh, uh, shall I repeat that then? The quote is from Health Canada. It's a, a publication in 2007. I think it's called Pesticides in Health. The quote is: It is good practice to reduce or eliminate any unnecessary exposure to pesticides. Unquote. And so that is a blanket exposure to pesticides that they're talking about. But I will point out that even though that was 2007, the kinds of cosmetic pesticides that we're talking about really haven't changed since then. It's the same kind of chemicals that are still being used. And uh, therefore, I think it is worth it to take this advice from Health Canada. Okay. Honorable MLA Gerard. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> The minister MLA, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. The minister has repeatedly referred Get this to right, 350 yeah. scientists, but has never given a, a list of these. And we suspect that a large majority of those are not involved in assessing this particular group of chemicals. Uh, but uh, I think that the important point that you make is that uh, safety for kids is important and I suspect that it's not just health but education extra expenses because you've got kids with learning problems and uh, kids with learning problems very often are frustrated go on to uh, be juvenile delinquents and crime so there's a costs in the justice system um, has, has anybody really done an assessment of what the total cost is 
Yes. Ms. Lindsay. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I think it goes without saying that even probably a single person that has to be hospitalized for cancer, probably the costs for that over the course of that person's life would be in excess of any Time's extra time. cost that a municipality we'll has to incur by rejecting the use of chemicals. So I don't, you know, it would be interesting to see those kinds of costs quantified, but I think common sense tells us that if we don't really need to use these substances, then why are we doing it? It makes no sense at all. Time for questions has now expired. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ms. Lindsay. We will call the next presenter, and I will remind the uh, MLAs present that 30 seconds all, is all that's allowed for questions, uh, and we will enforce that. Oh, we're going back. We will call uh, Katrina Steffenhofer, private citizen. Ms. Steffenhofer, would you please proceed with your presentation? Thank you. Uh, my name is Katharina Stiefenhofer. I am an award-winning documentary filmmaker with an interest in environmental justice and community health. I'm also a passionate vegetable and flower gardener, and I grow plenty of healthy foods without the use of chemical pesticides or synthetic, synthetic fertilizers. I also enjoy urban and forest foraging for wild foods and medicines. I am strongly opposed to any rollbacks of the non-essential pesticide ban as proposed in Bill 22, which should be withdrawn as it is a step backward. We desperately need to reduce the accumulation of toxic chemicals in our environments and their harmful effects on the health of all life forms. I have been diagnosed with breast cancer twice. And I agree with the Canadian Cancer Society's directive of a phase out of cosmetic pesticides on golf courses, sporting facilities, home vegetable and fruit gardens. Therefore, I'm asking for an expansion of the cosmetic pesticide ban rather than a rollback, including the following. Golf courses and sporting facilities. Um, pesticides used should be phased out of golf courses and sports facilities, especially where children often are or if they are located next to residential and public areas. Pesticides should be used as the last option in the smallest possible amount and only where needed to make a place usable. People should stay away from treated areas for at least 48 hours after the last amount of pesticide is applied. Home vegetable and fruit gardens. The use of pesticides in home or personal vegetable and fruit gardens should also be phased out. Although, also, the pesticides you use at home may be milder than those used for agriculture, and you may use them less often, there is still risk. In the agriculture industry, there are usually more rules in place to reduce, uh, reduce exposure, such as training for people who apply pesticides to properly use equipment that protects them, plants to reduce residue levels and pesticide drift, and rules to limit access to sprayed areas. Non-essential cosmetic, pe cosmetic pesticides should not be readily available to consumers, but should be locked up like prescription drugs because they pose potential health risks. Cosmetic Pesticide Ban Manitoba states the following on its website. 
More than 30 health and environmental organizations are appealing to the Manitoba government to maintain the province's restrictions on non-essential uses of pesticides. The Manitoba College of Family Physicians, Manitoba Health Coalition, Manitoba Lung Association, Manitoba Public Health Association, Learning Disabilities Association of Manitoba, and the Winnipeg Humane Society are among the organizations speaking out. The groups have endorsed an open letter to Jeff Wharton, Minister of Environment, Climate and Parks, and Audrey God Gordon, Minister of Health, warning that resuming the use of currently banned pesticides will increase health risks for Manitobans, particularly for children. Allowing the use of risk riskier lawn pesticides will also increase chemical runoff into waterways, harm essential pollinators, and increase risks for pets that play on treated, treated lawns. Jeff Wharton, Minister of Environment, Climate and Parks, said the province turns to Health Canada when it comes to evaluating pesticide products and all products used in the province are federally approved. Health Canada ensures that pesticide products do not present accept unacceptable risks to Canadians and the environment. Pathways of exposure, including dietary drinking water and and residential exposures are considered in the risk assessment. I'm quoting what Mr. Jeff Wharton said. The problem is that Health Canada registers pesticides not based on safety, but on acceptable risk. My question to Health Canada, what are these acceptable risks? Is, for example, the possible or probable development of cancer in humans an acceptable risk? In 2015, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer identified glyphosate, the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, the world's most commonly used herbicide, as a probable human carcinogen. Yet, Health Canada still maintains that glyphosate is safe. During research for my documentary film, From Seat to Seat 2018, I phoned Health Canada to inquire about the scientific sources they based the safety, and I put this in quotation marks, of glyphosate on, and was told that they rely on industry supplied data, i.e by Monsanto and Bayer, who assure Health Canada that their product is safe. Now, that is clearly a conflict of interest. When I asked why Health Canada does not do their own independent scientific reviews of these herbicides, I was told that would be too expensive. Think about that. Into the Weeds, a new documentary film, 2022, by Jennifer Beichwall, should be mandatory viewing for anyone making policy decisions involving the herbicide glyphosate roundup. The film is available for free streaming on CBC Gem. This film was the opening film of Hot Dogs this year in Toronto, and it also was the season opener of uh, The Passion and I on CBC. Into the Weeds, Dwayne Lee Johnson versus Monsanto Company follows former groundskeeper Johnson and his fight against Monsanto, a multinational agrochemical corporation acquired by German pharmaceutical giant Bayer in 2018. Johnson's case was the first to go to trial in a series of lawsuits involving tens of thousands of plaintiffs who claim that Monsanto's weed killer, Roundup, and its other glyphosate-based herbicide, Ranger Pro, caused their cancer. Bayer maintains that it's safe to use. 
The documentary follows the groundbreaking trial, including the re release of the Monsanto papers, internal documents which reveal that for decades, Monsanto had been influencing studies about glyphosate's potential to cause cancer. The film introduces other plaintiffs whose lives have been upended by their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma diagnosis, while also looking into the widespread and systemic effects of the world's most widely used herbicide. In the film, a team of lawyers gained access to internal emails that demonstrate clearly that Monsanto knew that glyphosate causes cancer but suppressed this knowledge and tried to discredit any scientists who tried to prove that glyphosate is a carcinogen. Moreover, the film proves that Monsanto manipulated scientific research and even influenced the FDA to rule in their favor. So, how much confidence should anyone have in any data provided to Health Canada by Monsanto slash Bayer about the so-called safety of glyphosate? Just please let that sink in. The World Health Organization unit finds that two 4-D herbicide possibly causes cancer in humans. A widely used farm chemical that is a key ingredient in a new herbicide developed by Dow AgroSciences possibly causes cancer in humans, the World Health Organization Research Unit has determined in 2015. 2-4-D, one my, of the my ingredients... My apologies, Ms. Stefanover, but time has expired. Leave. Leave. Yeah, leave to continue. Is there agreement for leave to continue? Yeah. You can say leave off the record. Leave. 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 You need to interrupt and recognize that I was talking Yeah, I have to interrupt and recognize you again, Ms. Stefanoffer. Please continue. Please continue, Ms. Stefanoffer. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that 2,4-D, which um, was one of the ingredients in Agent Orange, is also an ingredient in Killex, the herbicides Killex and PAR3, which are readily available for use by homeowners. Um, and it is a possible human carcinogen. Um, as, um, and there's evidence that, that it damages human cells and in a number of studies cause cancer in laboratory Very animals. Sorry. Yet Health Canada maintains that 2,4-D is safe. Remember thalidomide and how the equivalent of Health Canada failed to protect Canadian citizens from severe birth defects? It took Health Canada three months after they'd been notified that the chemical had been uh, withdrawn in Germany and England before they took it off the market. The widespread, pra widespread practice of pre-harvest glyphosate desiccation seven days before harvest has incre increased glyphosate in our food and in our environment, including groundwater. Subsequently, Health Canada requested to increase the allowable level of glyphosate in foods and drinking water. Thankfully, the Liberal government paused this request. The European Union uses the precautionary principle, i.e., if a pesticide is not proven to be safe, it is not registered. In the EU, there is no safe allowable level of pesticides in drinking water. This choice indicates the political will of legislatures to avoid risking the health of its citizens, the environment, and all life forms. It is a choice. Hopefully, the legislatures at Health Canada and the Manitoba government will adopt the wisdom of the precautionary principle and for the safety of our children and grandchildren, will choose to protect the health of Canadians and Manitobans 
by banning the use of cosmetic pesticides altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stefanoffer, for your presentation. Uh, I'll now call for questions from the committee. Uh, the Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Stefanoffer, for your uh, Ms. Stefanoffer, officer, for your uh, Hofer, for your presentation. Very, uh, uh, very fulsome. I appreciate the uh, the information, and as I said earlier, um, that's why uh, these committee meetings are so important uh, to hear from uh, Manitobans. Um, and and I sure I, I'm sure I speak for everyone around the table and wishing you all the best during your health journey as well, um, being a cancer uh, survivor uh, as well. So. Um, I, I just wanted to say that we agree when you uh, quote, therefore, I'm asking an expansion. Time. Oh, I'm out of time? Oh, you yes. guys got to stop that, man. It's pretty fast. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Ms. Stefanoffer, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, ask the Just question. Speak off the record, please. Sure. Mi Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be very, very quick. We have actually, our government is expanding in, in Bill 22 uh, to ensure that we are uh, protecting uh, the areas that you are specifically mentioning, uh, playgrounds, picnic areas, dog parks, provincial parks, uh, municipal playgrounds. We, we recognize, we, by the way, will have uh, some of the strongest legislation west of Ontario, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, currently do not have any restrictions on the items that I just mentioned. So I just wanted to get that on the record. But you're still... Uh, Ms. Ms. Steffenhofer, please. Yeah. Now you can respond. Can I... Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Learning. Uh, but you would still allow for any homeowner to go out and to buy Roundup, Clyphosat, or Killex off the shelf and to use as they see fit and what about, what about lawn companies? Would they be allowed to use Roundup anywhere they please? Thank you for your answer. Um, MLA uh, Naylor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina, for being here tonight. And I know all the work that you've done on the environment and educating people, including me, over the last few years. Um, I, so I want to thank you for taking the time and I, I just, you referenced the um, Into the Weeds, and I would also, you know, I echo that that's a really important documentary for folks to watch. Um, and, it, and I was struck by the fact that it, it is leading, like some of those lawsuits, multi-million dollar lawsuits, are leading um, Health Canada to start to reevaluate glyphosate, which I think we should be ahead of the game and not waiting for that. Um, I guess my question is, is there anything else you want to say about that product or that you didn't get a chance to say? Well, I, hey, Ms. Stefanoffer, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I really, really strongly encourage anyone thinking about the question of cosmetic herbicides and herbicides at all and Roundup glyphosate in particular please take the time to watch Into the Weeds, available free for streaming on GEM CBC. And you will be, I think, blown away, blown away, but, but these are facts. They could never, ever have a, a documentary that can, you know, can be challenged in court. So everything in this documentary is true and vetted by lawyers. So that is the truth and really an eye opener. And I hope you go and take a look at that before you make any decisions, any decisions on cosmetic pesticides. And since we are with agriculture and food, I think it also affects how we um, grow our food. Okay. Uh, MLA uh, Gerard? Yeah, uh, you've talked about the link between pesticides and cancer. Is there any link between pesticides and breast cancer, for example? Yes. Um, that was listed. So, uh, yes, Ms. Stefanhofer. Uh -huh. Yes, there is a link between pesticides and breast cancer, but um, my dear dad, a farmer all his life, 
died of pancreatic cancer in 2013. And he was a conventional farmer and had lots of contact with pesticides. And his um, neighbor, best friend, farmer that he farmed together with, the year before him died of cancer. So um, I think it's um, anyone who is in close contact with these toxic chemicals, with these pesticides, is at higher risk of contracting cancer. So thank you, Ms. Stefanoffer. Time for questions has expired. So thank you for your presentation. I'm going to ask the committee for leave to extend the question period to 45 seconds. Do we have agreement on that? Agreed. 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 For 30 doesn't so agreed we're waiving rule 92. Oh, technically we are waiving rule 92-2C. Yes. Agreement to do that? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much for the cooperation of the committee. I will now call the next presenter, calling Al Mackling, private citizen. Call him once again, Al Ma Mackling, private citizen, not here. Go to the bottom of the list. Calling Steve Ra, private citizen. Steve Ra, private citizen, not in attendance. Go to the bottom of the list. Calling Glenn Korolek, Manitoba Eco Network. For everyone's information then on the committee, um, before we begin the presentation, we cannot waive that rule. So 30 seconds is all you're allowed for, for questions. I know it's a challenge, but please try and comply. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Korolak. And now, if you're ready, please, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I'd like to address the question that was brought up previously by Honorable Jeff Wharton in regard to the extra protections that were, were, were being brought in with this bill. Uh, that, that may be true, but if you look at a city as, you know, the size of Winnipeg, uh, all that area that the, the bill is protecting is, is less than 15% of the area. So, so uh, the majority of uh, land and land use in Winnipeg will be, will be a lot of lawns, private lawns. So, so it's a bit of a moot point there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Glenn Korolek, and I'm the executive director of the Manitoba Eco Network. Since 1988, Manitoba Eco Network has promoted positive environmental action by supporting people and groups in our community. Our programming focuses on policy advocacy, engagement and consultation processes, and developing capacity building tools that benefit the environmental nonprofit sector and our member groups. We are a public interest environmental organization seeking to promote and facilitate good environmental governance and the protection of Manitoba's environment for the benefit of current and future generations. Um, we are disappointed with Bill 22 and ask that this bill be withdrawn. It is a step backwards in a time when we know we have to reduce exposure to chemical pesticides. There's ample evidence in the form of scientific and independent peer-reviewed research that conclude chemical pesticides impact human health, the environment, especially our aquatic ecosystems, and biodiversity. Uh, in, in fact, Environment and Climate Change Canada's own website states that households use chemical pesticides and fertilizers to improve the look of their lawns and gardens. These chemicals can pollute lakes and rivers that may be sources of drinking water for some communities. Chemical pesticides are also toxic to many forms of life and can threaten beneficial species such as bees that are important pollinators. That's Environment Canada. Uh, according to the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, CAPE for short, 
To protect human and environmental health and safety, the control of pests should center on fundamental principles of public health and environmental protection, including the application of the precautionary principle. Uh, you've heard that many times already tonight. Harm or hazard prevention, health promotion, and environmental justice. Furthermore, CAPE emphasizes that exposure to non-essential pesticides creates additional costs for the province's healthcare system and affects the lives of those who struggle with illnesses and conditions associated with such pesticide exposures. And as, as we've discussed already tonight, uh, as we know, there are shortcomings as to how the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, PMRA, of Health Canada, at, at how it registers and regulates pesticides. The Pest Management Regulatory Agency uses a risk-based approach in their assessments and not the precaution, precautionary principle. As pointed out by the Standing Committee on Health in their statutory review of the Pest Control Products Act, a lack of evidence is, is a lack of evidence of risk is not the same thing as evidence of no risk. The onus must be on the manufacturer to prove there are no health risks. As noted by EcoJustice Canada, the European Union achieves this balance. If proof of the product safety is not supplied, then it will not be registered there. For this reason and others, that is why a province, territory, municipality, or Indigenous government has the legislative and regulatory authority to prohibit the use of a registered pesticide in its jurisdiction. Or it may add more restrictive conditions on the use of a product than those established under the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Health Canada's Pest Management Regu Regulatory Agency is currently undergoing a transformation process that will strengthen its oversight and its protection of human health and the environment. The transformation process will also make the PMRA more transparent to people in Canada. The European Union's 2020 Biodiversity Strategy includes proposals for legally binding targets to reduce pesticide use and risk by 50% by the year 2030, as well as a ban on the use of pesticides in protected areas and other ecologically sensitive areas. As stated by the European Commission, the proposal to reduce the use of chemical pesticides translates their commitment to halt biodiversity loss in Europe into action. Canada must match this commitment and establish a legislative framework for achieving pesticide use reduction targets. Unfortunately, Bill 22 sends Manitoba into the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Korolak. Um, I will now have questions. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Korolak, for your presentation. Uh, certainly, uh, again, lots of, uh, lots of valuable information for the committee. And, uh, in particular, I pay special attention to your comment about the Health Canada Pest Management Regulatory Agency currently undergoing a transformation process that will strengthen its oversight. Well, we couldn't agree more with that, and certainly we'll work in, in lockstep with the federal government as they continue to uh, ensure that Manitobans, particularly Canadians, are safe uh, when applying products uh, such as cosmetic pesticides. So certainly agree with that, and I thank you for your presentation. Mr. Corolla. Is that a question? <laughs> yes. Well, well I, I hope the province of Manitoba is is pushing for uh, stronger uh, a stronger legislative framework than it's currently proposing for from Bill 22. So, thank you, MLA Naylor. Thank you so much uh, for being here this evening and for all the work you do in the environment sector. Um, I I appreciate. Um, I think in my 30 seconds, I just want to correct this notion that um, this is stronger legislation. One of my concerns is that, you know, now, so it can't be used around schools, but the municipalities can put it on the boulevards outside of schools. Someone running a home daycare could live next door to someone spraying their lawn. What do you think about that? Mr. Corolla. Uh Well, okay. So I, I think uh, one of the... Th I mean, our, our organization is calling for the withdrawal of this bill, but one of the egregious aspects of this bill is, is that there's no remedies for, for, for people uh, if there's an environmental uh, injustice that occurs. So um, let, let's say, you know, I live in the West End, I have a small lot, and both my neighbors are, are, are spraying like crazy. Let's say I have a 
grandmother who's old and, and susceptible to chemicals, and my daughter's uh, having a baby. So A, I, I'm not being notified of them spraying. Uh, I'm right next door. There's no buffers or anything. And, and so, so that's a real problem because uh, the people should have the right to know and they should be notified. And, and, and that whole process, uh, uh, it, you know, in, people have to make an informed decision. So there's nothing in, in Bill 22 that, that does that. So, so that, I mean, that, that's very problematic. Right now, there's nothing a citizen could do. They can't go to court. They can't find, uh, you know, their neighbor. It's, 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 it's crazy. Thank you. MLA Gerard? Yeah, I wonder if you would take that further. What sort of remedies would you see where there is um, uh, toxic effects of uh, these cosmetic pesticides? Well, uh, I, I mean, Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Korolak, my, my fault. Sorry, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, the first choice is, is not to use them, so they should be banned. We should be following what's happening in the European Union. Uh, having said that, and if that's not the approach, then we need legislation that allows citizens to go to court. Uh, right now, uh, CEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, is before uh, the House, and there's, there's uh, a, you know, a, there's a campaign to make that bill more stronger and giving citizens uh, the right to, to sue. Because uh, right now, th there is no legislation in Manitoba or even at the federal level where, where ordinary citizens like us could, could, could uh, take someone to court if, if we're being harmed. MLA Naylor. Thank you. I, on that uh, note, on that line, thinking about legalities, um, certainly we know that uh, companies like the owners of Roundup, Monsanto, and others have been sued for the harms their chemicals have caused. Do you know of any municipalities or um, governments anywhere that perhaps have been sued because of bringing back or rolling back harmful legislation like this? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Korla. Uh, no, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not aware, but I'm sure there is. I, you know, we, we would have to get a lawyer to, to check up on that. Uh, if you want to hold the bill, I, I could do that research if you want. Get back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, time has expired, I believe. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Next presenter is Wendy Bulow, private citizen. And you're ready to go? Uh, I Pre please proceed with your presentation, Ms. Bulow. Okay. Um, my name is Wendy Bulow, and thank you for the opportunity to present at this committee. I'm speaking against Bill 22, uh, the Environment Act on Pesticide Restrictions. So along with the concerns for human health with which the others have spoken of so well, um, I'm advocating for the insect and natural world and the biodiversity that insects need. I'm a volunteer with the David Suzuki uh, Butterfly Ranger program. And to be clear, I'm not representing the foundation in any, any way. I'm here on my own. But we've had lots of education and scientists presenting to us for the past three years and really digging into, um, you know, habitat and pesticides and why we're, um, why, you know, we're losing our species and so on. Um, and I've got a present, I've got a whole bunch of links at the very end of my presentation paper. Um, this is may sound alarmist, but Many of you might know this already, but we are actually in the middle of an insect apocalypse. And here is from a few years ago, the National Geographic. It says, you'll miss them when they're gone, and we're losing, losing them. Um, so some stats. Uh, 
we've lost 76% of our flying insects in the last 27 years. And that's um, actually a stat from 2017 and from the Creefield Entomology Society, Entomological Society. And there's a peer-reviewed article in my notes at the end. Um, and right now, 40% of our insect species are actually threatened with extinction. And the reasons are um, climate change, habitat loss, and pesticide use. And uh, the one thing that we can have an immediate effect on to um, maybe turn this thing around or at least <laughs> stop it somewhat um, would be the continued banning of the toxic pesticides and not only keeping the same rules, but let's uh, in, um, make stronger protections. We really need a lot stronger protections in our private and public spaces. Uh, importantly, like the pesticides we're talking about today are for cosmetic. And that's, I'm not talking about agricultural purposes. But like there's a weird thing about the current law, like we can use pesticides in our gardens and our vegetables and flowers and things, I believe, but not on our lawn. But like we'd be eating, like spraying stuff on stuff we'd be eating and flowers that are attracting butterflies and it's just kind of caught me like, anyway, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it is. Um, back to the insects. Uh, why should we care? Uh, a famous quote by E.O. Wilson is, um, insects are the little things that run the world. And without them, we're kind of hooped. Um, they have a PR problem. Insects, they can look weird and possibly scary. And a lot of people don't like insects, you know, mosquitoes, ugh. But um, in reality, only about 3% of insects are actually considered pests. The rest are beneficial. They're out there doing their thing. Some just or whatever they are, they're just living their own lives. They're not bothering us at all. Uh, reasons we should protect them um, is ecosystem services. So that's a selfish human reason. Uh, insects pollinate plants. One third of our food crop, and it's all the stuff most people like the best, like raspberries, strawberries, apples, peas, zucchinis, melons, blueberries, blah, 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 chocolate. <laughs> See, we don't grow it here, but that's a big one. Um, that's all pollinated by bees and insects. Uh, here's an example of what can happen if we don't uh, smarten up. Um, in southwest China, where wild bees have been eradicated by excessive pesticide use and a lack of natural habitat, farmers had been forced to hand pollinate their trees, carrying pots of pollen and paintbrushes from which to individually pollinate every flower using their children to climb up to the highest blossoms of the fruit trees, like apples and pears. And this is part of an article that I've got at the, cited at the end. Uh, okay, another, insects decompose waste and organic matter. It's very messy without them. We'd have, uh, you know, just waste everywhere. Uh, in insects control pest populations, so insects control other insects. Nature in balance has predators for what we may consider pest insects in our gardens. Pests don't pick and choose the beneficial, or pesticides don't pick and choose. Like they're not going, that, that one's a pest, this one's a good one. They don't, everything's gone, you know, like when you're doing the pesticide thing. Uh, insects are beautiful and inspiring. For example, the monarch butterfly and its journey. I mean, who doesn't know about that? And we do know that now monarchs are an endangered species, or th endangered, threatened, near extinction. I'm not sure about my wording. Uh, and number five, uh, insects feed birds. And I don't know if any of you are birders, but I am. That's kind of how I got into the insect thing. Uh, but birds don't feed their babies like nuts and seeds and things we might put in our little bird feeders and that. They eat larva. They eat insects and caterpillars and larva and stuff like that. So they need soft food and a chickadee may feed approximately 6,000 to 9,000 larvae and insects to one clutch of baby birds. So that's, that's a lot. And so they've got to, if, if somebody comes along and sprays down a tree full of, you know, undesirables, that's like the food source, we lose our birds. Um, 
Okay, so in cities and non-agricultural lands, we can do something to help the insect populations. As I said, agriculture is another story. Conventional farming uses pesticides, and change can be very difficult financially for farmers, and maybe that's the future coming up sometime. Uh, the, this bylaw amendment would allow anyone to purchase and use currently banned pesticides on lawns, driveways, ditches, close to waterways, pretty much everywhere, except for a few places mentioned, children's playgrounds, dog, dog parks, and provincial parks. Um, some of the pesticides, I'm not gonna go through them because they, they did. I wanna get to something else. Uh, okay, the one pesticide I really wanted to tag, which they didn't talk about, was the neonicanoids. Neo, uh, neonics, I'll call them, and uh, a lot of places, you know, golf courses and stuff use them. And I talk about a possible use for cosmetic pesticides is to grow the perfect lawn, and it is a colonial idea. Lawns did not exist here, I don't believe, before colonization. They are considered an ideal of high status, brought to North America by Europeans. And many feel, people feel that to be a good neighbor, we should have a perfect lawn. And most lawns are made up of an actually invasive, like a foreign species, an invasive species, Kentucky bluegrass from Eurasia. Anyway, these non-native lawns need lots of care, water mowing, and then we think we need weed management, but maybe we don't. Um, I talk about, do, 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 do. I wanted to talk a little bit about golf courses in my last minute, 43. Uh, so my family and friends love golf. Um, and there, every year there's like, I just brought, these are like tons and tons of chemical notices of stuff they want to use. And it's all the things that they've talked about and more. Um, products list to cancers, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, sarcoma. Okay, so here's the weird thing. On one hand, this proposed amendment will protect dogs in the dog park, but they're not gonna protect golfers like my friends and family on the golf course. Like, why do dogs get the protection? I sort of resent that. I wish we could do a little more for our, our golfers. And uh, some golf courses are rising to the challenge on their own, and it's working. A program called Monarchs in the Rough. And I can read my notes. So I'll just jump ahead to the end. In closing, um, we have some pretty big global issues going on right now, and we can be working on climate change. It goes along with global warming of the planet. Let's reframe the way we look at our landscape, see beauty and diverse landscape, and that's better suited to our climate and support wildlife. Um, people care deeply about our large animals in crisis such as the polar bears and the white rhinos. And let's care about the little guys too. So let's care about the bees and the other insects which are going extinct because of all these different things. But pesticides is a big part of it. And let's, uh, um, I'd like to really see greater restrictions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, time has expired. Thank you, Ms. Bulow, for your presentation. Does the committee have questions for the Honourable Minister? Well, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bulow, for your uh, presentation. Certainly appreciate um, understanding, again, uh, some of the concerns that you have with respect. I know it's hard to hear. Um, with respect to uh, bees and, and birds, of course, uh, um, we certainly share those concerns, too, as well. And, I take special note just to comment. I only have about 10 seconds left. So just a comment, though, um, with golf courses. I mean, municipalities and golf courses and other areas will have a choice whether they choose to use a cosmetic pesticide or not. It's not mandatory that everybody needs to go out and buy a cosmetic pesticide. So it's just giving them more choice. Okay. Ms. Bulow. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Ms. Yeah. Bulow. Uh, just to answer with the golf course, I, I agree. It's a, But I, I would like to see... Um, I think it's so easy to use the conventional, here, let's get our pesticides out and let's do what we've done every year and this is what we do and this is how we manage it. But I think it, they need a, a push to change. I think we need guidance. And when the government would give good, strong guidance on, on you know, clamping down on, on this use, I mean, like, 
they're, they're massive lists of stuff they use. They use everything in the book. And there's also these young workers out there, like they're, you know, good jobs for kids. They get out there and I, like, I just hope they're, they're managed properly, but that's what I can say. I think there's options, but I think government can be a leader. MLA Naylor. Thank you very much, Wendy, for being here and for sharing your perspectives. Um, I don't have a lawn. I have a pollinator garden in my house, at the front of my house. So instead of lawn from one side of the property to the other stretches my garden. And on any given summer day, there's hundreds if not thousands of pollinators in that garden. So w what should I expect to happen if the city comes along and sprays the boulevard in front of my house that's just separated by a sidewalk from the boulevard to my garden where there's thousands of bees on a summer day? Do you, like, what affected by that spray a few feet away? Do you know? If you don't know, that's... Ambulay, or Ms. Bulow, please. Uh, well, most... Uh, most of this stuff drifts and the, the bugs are, like if you're already attracting, you've got a banquet in your yard. It sounds pretty fantastic. And, uh, you know, not everybody can do that, but it's, when you, when you, when you put it in place, it's great. Um, but you're attracting them and then these same bees that have been so happily attracted by your beautiful plants are all of a sudden going on the poison like some sort of toxic chemical, like I'm not sure what, what they would be spraying for, but it could poison them. That's all. Yeah. MLA Trey. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in your comments on birds, and I'm aware that there have been drastic and very dramatic declines in some insectivores, uh, barn swallows, but on the endangered list in some areas, uh, chimney swifts. I wonder if you'd comment further on the impact on birds. Ms. Bureau? Um, some of that would be habitat loss because we're losing all our big old barns and the chimneys that these uh, birds did colonize in. Uh, also, um, I think it's, we we're, we're just have less and less insects and that's their main food source. And so when we're losing our insects and especially like I spend a lot of time in Dunatar on the shore of Lake Winnipeg, and um, we've got quite a good bird population there. We have our barn swallows, and it's pretty wonderful. But we have a pretty good insect life. We're losing, we don't have our monarchs this year for some reason, but we've got great insect life, and we have so many birds there. And you come to the city, and we spray for canker worms, we spray for mosquitoes, we've got this other stuff going on, and uh, it's a, kind of a dead zone in Wolseley anyway for a lot of birds, which it shouldn't be because we have great trees there. So, any further questions from the committee? Thank you for your presentation. Committee will call uh, Cameron Wilson uh, with Newdorf, North America. Sir, I know the staff will be Is that an online? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to promote him in. Can you ask him to turn on his camera and unmute? So could Mr. Uh, Wilson turn on his camera and unmute? We seem to have have you there now. Um, we're not hearing you yet. How about now? Okay. Are you ready to do your presentation, Mr. Uh, Wilson? Yes, I am. Uh, just okay. to confirm, do you have the brief that I supplied? Okay. We're ready to go. Please proceed with, okay. with your presentation. Thank you for inviting me to speak on Bill 22, the Environmental Amendment Act, Pesticide Restrictions. My name is Cameron Wilson. I'm a graduate of the University of Manitoba Department of Agriculture and a holder of several patents on low-risk pesticides. I have worked on the development of low-risk pesticides for greater than 25 years. Currently in Canada, several provinces ban or restrict the use and sale of pesticides for cosmetic purposes, including Manitoba, Ontario, 
Quebec, PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland Labrador. The common intent is to minimize adverse impacts to human health and the environment. Bill 22 significantly reverses this intent and outcome in Manitoba. My presentation will provide the Standing Committee with information so the members can make a science-based decision regarding the widespread use of almost any pesticide for cosmetic use in Manitoba. My first comment is about why provinces, U.S. counties, and many European countries have implement, implemented pe cosmetic pesticide bans or restrictions. Such bans and re restrictions target the older synthetic herbicides that were first registered in, for use in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Canada. These groups of pesticides, for example, 2,4-D, are now known and being proven to be toxic to small animals, birds, aquatic organisms, and pose a risk to human health. Many of these targeted banned herbicides are listed by the World Health Organization. Um, and I have, if you have my brief, you'll see in Appendix 1 the um, classification of this group of herbicides. These are classified as possible, uh, possible cancer-causing agents. Interesting enough, they're classified in the same area as T uh, DDT, which we're all familiar with. The intent of cosmetic pesticide bans is twofold, to reduce the levels of these substances in our environment and to limit the exposure and risk of these substances to people, especially children. Limiting uses of pesticides of concern does work. Ontario implemented a province-wide cosmetic pesticide ban in April 2009. In 2014, an assessment study reported a significant decline of the presence and cosmetic pesticides in surface waters ranging from 16 to 92 percent. And the quote is it, uh, Todd and Sturger, 2014. If Bill 22 is passed and the result, the result will be increased and in widespread exposure throughout Manitoba of many of these older high-risk herbicides for the sole purpose of applying them to lawns and urban boulevards. But lower risk herbicides are readily available and already allowed under the current Environmental Act. The impact of Bill 22 is significant. It introduces the widespread use of the high risk pesticides for cosmetic purposes. Bill 22 is not needed. My second comment relates to the information presented on March 14th of this year at the government's news conference announcing the introduction of Bill 22. First, Reference was made to a public consultation undertaken in 2016 and the proposed amendments in Bill 22 are, are based largely on that survey conducted now six years ago. However, in that survey, only 15% of the respondents reported that they had a basic or full understanding of the issues of pesticides. In other words, 85% of respondents did not have any have, have even a basic understanding of the issue. Second, as the news conference, at the same news conference, the public was told that low risk pesticides currently allowed for cosmetic use are too expensive and ineffective. Those comments are disputed. Regarding costs, when new innovative herbicides first come into market, the price may be relatively higher due to development, field testing and registration requirements especially when compared with herbicides developed 60 or 70 years ago. Typically, the longer a product is on the marketplace, the price decreases. Information below, and it'll be in your handout, show a price comparison for typical homeowner products. And in figure one, you'll see, this is from Home Depot in Winnipeg in July, that uh, uh, Killex, which is a conventional herbicide, Weed Be Gone is a low risk, um, in this case, the weed be gone is actually a little bit cheaper in the five liter size. And in the one liter concentrate, the synthetic is slightly cheaper. So you can see they're, they're very similar in price. In some cases, a new lower risk pesticide such as weed be gone is actually less expensive than the sy synthetic counterpart, as I mentioned. In other cases, a new herbicide may have a higher cost, but the difference in cost for the average size lawn is not substantive. In discussing costs, proponents of Bill 22 have not mentioned that herbicide costs for professional lawn care operators are only one component of their fee. 
in actuality, labor is the number one cost of, the, of most lawn care operators, not the cost of the herbicide. Regarding performance, Health Canada requires field tests before a herbicide is approved for use. Field trials worldwide have demonstrated that new lower risk herbicides, such as Fiesta, are effective in controlling weeds and lawns. Such alternate pesticides also have other multiple advantages, no strong chemical smell, low to no toxicity to fish and mammals, and no surface water concerns. If you look at your briefing note, figures two and three, you'll see some turf sprayed with Fiesta and untreated. So you can clearly see that for two applications, it truly does work. And in figure three, there's a graph showing uh, Fiesta compared to a conventional uh, three-way herbicide and untreated. And you'll actually see that the low risk product is faster. And after two applications at 56 days, they have equal activity. And this was down on dandelions in turf. I'll continue. Third, on March 14th, the public was told if Health Canada has approved a pesticide, that it is deemed safe for use in Manitoba. Again, this comment requires clarification. First, Health Canada does not ever deem or proclaim a pesticide as safe. Health Canada sets the bare minimum standard for how a pesticide can be used in Canada and identifies any danger or concerns on the approved label. The example below is a label of a herbicide that Manitoba proposes under Bill 22 amendment for widespread use in Manitoba. This herbicide contains three herbicide active ingredients. This product has a poison statement on the front label and the po poison statement is one of the worst toxic classifications given by Health Canada. See figures four and five of my brief. This product to be allowed under Bill 22 also includes an environmental hazard statement. Warning, specifying, toxic to small wild animals, birds, and aquatic organisms. Available alternate low risk pesticides currently already allowed under the Environmental Act have no to low toxicity to non-target organisms. Considering the number of fish bearing rivers and lakes in Manitoba, Introducing back the old herbicides have great potential over time to damage the sports and commercial fishing industries of Manitoba. Also considering the frequent heavy rains and flooding, like in 2022 over southern Manitoba, introducing back unknown and unregulated quantities of high-risk pesticides in Manitoba for only cosmetic purposes poses a great and unnecessary risk to local communities. Also consider home daycares, and this was mentioned earlier. Think about how many children are cared for in home daycares throughout the province. What if the neighbor to your daycare proceeds to spray their lawn with a pesticide that is currently not allowed and the spray drifts to your daycare and your garden? Um, how will Manitoba police this? If a child of the daycare gets sick, who's liable? What are the consequences when a pesticide applicator sprays a boulevard near a school with a herbicide with a poison label? Should a city of Winnipeg or Portage of Prairie or Brandon employee be forced to spray these older herbicides if, uh, if their use is allowed? I encourage the standing committee members and Manitoba government to consider the questions of care, community, and liability. It is our collective responsibility and duty to protect our children and families, our elderly, pets, pesticide applicators, waterways, animal life, and sustaining environments as best we can with science, intellect, and good sense. If Bill 22 is approved, the widespread application of high-risk chemical pesticides will be allowed and, we will, and will occur. If Bill 22 is approved, Manitoba will be the only jurisdiction in the world that I'm aware of to rescind its allowable cosmetic pesticide uses to once again allow herbicides of concern, setting a bad precedent. I ask the committee and the Manitoba government to review and rethink the proposed amendments in Bill 22. Bill 22 is flawed. It is not based on accurate understanding of pesticide composition and federal regulation. Time has and expired, has Mr. Wilson. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Wilson. Do members of the committee have uh, questions for the presenter? Honorable Minister. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson, for presenting tonight. Uh, 
um, and presenting under this, uh, well, the, this new COVID, uh, post-COVID way, of course, we're still doing it through uh, Zoom and Teams. So it's great that you can join us from, uh, from uh, wherever you are tonight. So welcome and thank you. And uh, I guess just a quick comment. Have you had the opportunity to uh, go through the bill uh, page by page and line by line? Mr. Wilson. Yes, I have looked through the bill. I got to go around. Um, MLA Naylor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I really appreciate your comments and, um, and the amount of knowledge and understanding that you have about these products. Um, I, I know you got cut off at the end, so I'm going to use my question to allow you to finish whatever you were saying at the end. Mr. Wilson. Sorry, thank you. I, just, my, I was finishing with Bill 22 is flawed. It is not based on accurate understanding of pesticide composition and the federal regulation, and it does not benefit the majority of Manitobans. Bill 22 should not be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, MLA Gerard. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you're very clear that the bill can result in the widespread use of high-risk pesticides. I just want you to uh, help us once more talk about why these would be high-risk pesticides. Mr. Wilson. As already demonstrated in other provinces, U.S. counties and countries, they've determined that the, the risk of exposure, in particular to children and waterways, of these particular group of herbicides is of concern. We know this already. Um, as I mentioned already, this would be the first jurisdiction in the world that we're aware of to go backwards on this. Um, as it says right on the label, toxic to fish, toxic to mammals, toxic to birds. Uh, Honourable Minister. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, over 60% of respondents said that the current restrictions were too strict, and over 70% wanted to see them reduced or rescinded. Um, I guess my question uh, to you, uh, sir, Mr. Wilson, is what do you tell, uh, as VP of Operations for New Dorf America, what do you tell 137 municipalities in Manitoba that are applying four to five times more product at four to five times more the rate over the last six years? Mr. Wilson. I would challenge that they actually have not been applying products and probably will not in the future because of labor shortages and labor costs. That the survey was again based on 15% people having a basic understanding of the survey. Does the committee have any further questions? Honorable Minister. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. And again, we would agree that it is uh, uh, policymakers and governments uh, that should be uh, at the table providing the best science and the best information uh, to their citizens uh, on any area, whether it be Health Canada approved food products, drugs, vitamins, children's toys, vaccines, alcohol, yeah. cannabis, or car seats. Uh, certainly, uh, I appreciate your time tonight, uh, Mr. Wilson, and uh, look forward to, uh, to any further comments you may have. Mr. Wilson? Thank you for the time, and as you know, you just mentioned it, provinces determine the uses of some of the uh, areas you've mentioned. And again, I'll just end with what has been determined by the World Health Organization and other municipalities and other counties and countries. Less than a minute left, MLA Naylor. Thank you. I'm just going to repeat the question I asked someone earlier about um, the risks of drift. What are the risks of drift? Like how, how far do these products drift when they're sprayed on lawns or they're sprayed outside of schools or they're sprayed in municipal parks? Mr. Wilson, 30 seconds. The, the, the risk of drift is a function of how strong the wind is and it will harm all non-target broadleaf plants. So your pollinator garden, if you have broadleaf flowers, they will be damaged. Trees will be damaged. Drift to people that don't wear respirators will occur. And again, to the daycare kids next to a homeowner spring. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Time has expired. 
we will call uh, the next presenter, which is Nicholas Sarasso, private citizen. Mr. Sarasso, I have your name correct? Sarasso. Thank you. And when you're ready, please begin your presentation. Hello, my name is Yannick Serso. I am an apolitical husband and father of two school-aged children. I have lived in Winnipeg and rural Manitoba my entire life and was very dismayed to hear of the proposed changes. I felt compelled to come forward today to ask you to reconsider this amendment without any, bi without any bias to any party or any way of thinking, merely the consideration of what is good for children, our loved ones, and our pets. During the previous reading of Bill 22, there were a combination of arguments for these amendments that, when placed side by side, seemed logical and compelling, but in reality, none of which are valid in this case. Firstly, and it, I struggle with the audience, I apologize, but these changes have nothing to do with agri agriculture, despite the great arguments met, made by um, some of the other speakers. Um, and it, it seems inappropriate and confusing to discuss amending these laws in the context of food production and agriculture when the discussion and proposed amendments are regarding the cosmetic use of these chemicals of which there is growing controversy. That said, if the desire is to associate with agriculture, I also encourage you to watch the Passionate Eye documentary Into the Weeds from CBC, where farmers acknowledge the risks associated with pesticides referring to lymphoma as a farmer's disease and how they choose to live with it as a means to, to an end in making a living. Secondly, the argument for the challenges faced by municipalities to manage weed control on public property like shoulders, parks, and boulevards is very flawed. I was easily able to find numerous references to rural municipalities where they, can, they are allowed to submit for allowances for land management under the pesticide use permit program, which they do. That means there is nothing stopping them from using anything they want with just a little planning and prior notice. Thirdly, the paper-based survey with limited distribution and uptake that has been referenced by this administration with 70% support for these amendments was conducted in 2016, six years ago, four years before a global pandemic highlighted the weakness of our medical system, the fragility of our planet's ecosystem, and a significant portion of our population voiced strong concerns over the credibility of Health Canada. It would seem only logical to consider resubmitting the survey again, notwithstanding the fact that there are thousands of new homeowners, taxpayers, and voters added to Manitoba since the survey was conducted. Don't they deserve a say? Finally, the strongest argument used by this administration for these changes has been Health Canada's position on these chemicals as safe. Again, as if it's absurd for Manitobans to have thoughts that might not align with Health Canada. Considering the current political climate brought on by the pandemic, it feels very ironic that I am debating this position, this current administration. That said, when Health Canada modifies its positions on a chemical, it does so after there is so much overwhelming data, it would be criminal not to pivot. When it does, there is nothing that can be done for the years that it was already used. In the 1990s, bisphenol A was safe in baby bottles until it wasn't. DDT was a safe insecticide until it wasn't. It took grassroots citizens and ecologists to start raising concerns about DDT. These concerns were largely discounted until they weren't. And it was, it was confirmed to be a carcinogen and an endocrine disruptor that accumulates in animal fat cells and is found in human breast milk to this day, despite being banned in the 70s. 2,4-D, one of the chemicals you plan to allow found in Killex and PAR-3 and a favorite of the lawn care community was classified as probably carcinogenic in 2015 by none other than the World Health Organization. You may not be aware that it was created during World War II for chemical warfare and used heavily during the Vietnam War conflict. It gives me no comfort to know that it's been watered down for residential use. Another good one, chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is a pesticide that has been improved for use since the 1960s. 
It is being used as we speak by the city of Winnipeg to combat Dutch elm disease. A little trivia, this chemical was designed by the Nazis as part of their chemical warfare arsenal. Chlorpyrifos has finally been concluded to be acutely toxic and associated with neurodevelopmental harms in children. Prenatal exposures to chlorpyrifos are associated with lower birth weight, reduced IQ, loss of working memory, attention disorders, and delayed motor development. Health Canada has only recently suspended all licenses for purchase of all variants of this chemical as of the end of this year. And we're still allowed to use it for one more year, luckily. What I'm trying to illustrate is that Health Canada approved does not mean safe. Unlike cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, agrochemical companies are not required to provide sufficient evidence that agricultural chemicals are safe to introduce into the environment before they can be sold. That approach is, of course, as you've heard many times, the precautionary principle. There is enough research indicating that the health and environmental problems associated with these products are cause for concern and more than enough evidence to indicate that we should not be cavalier about their use. Further to this, Health Canada's conclusions rely almost entirely on industry-funded studies. This data is typically not made available for public viewing or for peer review, which is normal in other scientific research. However, in agrochemicals, this information is considered proprietary and therefore protected. Frustratingly, these studies are rarely, if ever, conducted in concert with other chemicals, such as already present in the soil, air, or waterways, nor do they consider the adjuvants that are part of larger cocktails when they will be used, and they are almost never considered for their impact over the long term when the chemicals find themselves in unanticipated locations through drift or migration, like on our pets or on our household dust. On top of that, while there is an expectation of, of impartiality, in order for a chemical to be restricted, Health Canada has the politically sensitive challenge of weighing the financial burden to industry over the environment and human health. Even if they do move to restrict chemicals actively used in agriculture, they know they will face legal challenges and appeals from the agrochemical industry. So for the most part, as previously stated, Health Canada has only required products be taken off the market after decades of use have re revealed undeniable harm to humans or the environment. This means you and I are the test subjects for all of these chemicals. For the purposes of simply protecting our children and pets in their yards and their neighborhoods, the province does not have these same challenges. We're only talking about restricting non-agricultural cosmetic use of these chemicals. Do you really, really want to be the first province to repeal their cosmetic pesticide ban? What will the province do if and when Health Canada does change their position on something like 2,4-D? Do you, you leave the province exposed to litigation by every Manitoban affected by corresponding illness. The lawsuits that continue to plague Bayer Monsanto over glyphosate have reached over 11 billion dollars and counting, with over 30,000 lawsuits pending. By reversing a law that protects people, you become an accomplice. Is that the legacy you're striving for? What we can do is recognize that these chemicals don't need to be used to maintain an impossible standard on lawns and boulevards. This concept of pristine monocultures comes from a climate that doesn't exist here. This may be necessary in modern farming practices, this is not the debate, but it has no justification on cosmetic surfaces. In conclusion, our government is elected to represent and act in the best interests of all of its people, not just populism. It's not just about an opinion of outspoken minority of landowners. It's there to create environmental and health regulations that protect life. Please, please don't rubber stamp this. I'm only asking for some vision and integrity from our government. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Sorasso. Before we go on to questions, we also have on our list a Yannick Sorasso. Is that you as well? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, we will strike that one. Um, now, uh, questions from the committee? Um, Honorable Minister? Just a comment, Mr. Chair, if I may, and thank you, Mr. Sorasso, for uh, your presentation. Uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, uh, one area that uh, that stuck out just near the end of your presentation was uh, uh, 
about uh, Health Canada and again the Manitoba Eco Network had made the comment as well of a stronger regulatory uh, framework being uh, looked at now when it comes to cosmetic pesticide. Certainly uh, our government will definitely follow uh, what the federal government uh, obviously deems safe uh, as they continue to go through that rigorous process. So I can tell you today that, that that's exactly what we'll continue to do is to follow the science. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, would you like to respond to that? No, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, Mr. I, Soroso. I yeah. would like to respond. Yeah. Actually, and the point that I've been trying to drive home is that Health Canada's accountability is almost unilaterally towards agriculture. And the companies that market those products and lobby for those products are focused almost entirely on agriculture. And their concerns is any form of bans are a slippery slope from those companies. And it's a challenge for Health Canada to look at the narrow focus of simply landscaping. And that is more the jurisdiction of municipalities and provinces. And that's what I'm asking for. Thank you. Ms. Naylor, MLA Naylor. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite informative. Um, and you, you noted uh, something, a note that I made here about um, Health Canada's studies on pesticides. And you said something that I wasn't previously aware of, that none of these studies are peer reviewed. And when I think about um, science, I know that su studies that aren't peer reviewed aren't meaningful, aren't really meaningful in science. So can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Because I think our government members need to understand the difference. Mr. Soroso. Um, what, so, so one of the things, for example, that the Monsanto papers revealed is that uh, many of the many of the even ones that are presented as peer-reviewed uh, always have a thread back to the uh, the agrochemical companies, and so that there is literally no one getting to actually review and have their opinion valued who isn't already vetted and approved. And that, again, that's for public record. If, if Anecdotally, they haven't officially proven glyphosate is bad. They've proven Monsanto is evil, and that's why they're losing all their lawsuits. So that's the issue with reading their papers. It's not that the, if we could already prove it was banned, then it would be banned all over the globe. But they can prove they are evil, and that's why they are losing all of their lawsuits. MLA Gerard. You talked early on about the risks, particularly to children from the use of some of these cosmetic pesticides. I wonder if you'd expand a little bit on that. Well, uh, Mr. Sorso? Uh, honest, honestly, um, I, I think that that probably isn't appropriate for myself to do that. I'm neither a scientist uh, or an agricultural professional. My information is accumulated by very intelligent, smart people like some of the speakers here that have made a, a career and a, and, a, and a near lifetime of, of educating themselves and learning about these things. Um, but uh, I will say that the, the data is there. It is easily found. It is easily sourced. And these are not on sketchy, dark web sites. These are not, these are not clandestine organizations presenting this information. Um, and it's there for the people that want to learn about it. Does the committee have any further questions for Mr. Soroso? Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Soroso. Committee now calls Troy B. Bailey, private citizen. Mr. Bailey, go to the bottom of the list. Committee now calls Vicki Burns, private citizen. Oh, a written submission has been received from Vicki Burns, a private citizen, who wished to present but was unable to be here this evening. Ms. Burns has provided a written submission which will now be distributed to all members. Does the committee degree agree to have this document appear in the Hansard transcript of this meeting? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Present, uh, that presentation will be distributed. Committee now calls David Hinton, Manitoba Nursery and Landscape Association.
you have a presentation to have distributed as well. Staff will do that. And when you are ready to do your presentation, you can begin. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. And I think we have um, you know, a very important topic here that uh, we need to talk That's about. Right. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. My name is David Hinton. I would like to uh, just give the Manitoba Nursery Landscape Association's um, opinions and recommendations on this uh, important subject uh, regarding the use of herbicides on lawns in Manitoba. We are pleased that the government has decided to clarify and update the regulations regarding the products used to protect the health and, of Manitoba's landscapes. The current legislation is arbitrary, confusing, and not well understood. It is also unenforceable, and compliance with the current regulations is really low. Better public policy that works for all Manitobans is necessary, and these changes are long overdue. Um, just a little bit about the Manitoba Nursery Landscape Association. Um, since 1958, the MBNLA has represented the horticulture profession in Manitoba. Our members grow, install, maintain the green in infrastructure in the province. Uh, member businesses include garden centers, greenhouses, landscape install and maintenance contractors, tree care companies, nurseries, and lawn care companies. We believe we have a unique understanding of this issue as we work with Manitobans every day to improve and maintain their landscapes. Our members are directly affected by the regulations introduced by the previous government and we applaud the changes that the government is proposing. I have personally been involved with the MBNLA since 2004 and served many roles over the years, including president. Um, I've also sat on the board of the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association as the Manitoba rep, um, the CNLA, the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association, represents over 4,000 horticultural businesses across Canada. Well, we've uh, been around the bend with everybody and uh, seen what's happened in, in many of the provinces uh, across Canada. So the current situation, um, you know, Manitobans take great pride in their homes and businesses. You can just visit any uh, home improvement store on a Saturday morning, you'll find countless homeowners looking for products and services to improve their corner of the world. The landscape is a natural extension of the home and many property owners consider the area outside their house just as or even more important than what's on the inside. And we know Manitobans want a choice. MBNLA delivered over 15,000 postcards to the previous government back in 2013 um, from Manitobans who did not want the province to restrict their ability to control weeds on their lawns. And since 2015, when the regulations came into effect, homeowners have been increasingly frustrated with their lack of ability to maintain their properties. Trees, shrubs, flowers, turf grass are important in many ways. They are not cosmetic, but actually have a very positive environmental impact. Healthy landscapes produce oxygen, absorb carbon dioxide, reduce runoff, and cool the surrounding areas. Maintenance of these areas is vital to maximize these benefits and weed control products play an important role in helping keep, keeping these areas healthy. The previous government introduced legislation that allows the use of only certain weed control products on lawns surrounding our homes, businesses, and public places. The current rules are arbitrary and confusing and have created many problems for our association members. Property owners are not satisfied with the approved tools because of the increased cost and the reduced effectiveness. The following issues are experienced by our members every day in Manitoba. So number one, retailers who have to enforce the law. So many of these products are sold at, you know, hardware stores, think Canadian Tire, and uh, many of the staff there are, are young part-time students and they're the ones who are enforcing this law. So when an old crusty guy like me goes in there and says, hey, I need some Killex for my garden okay okay you can have it it's for your garden here you go and out the store i go right so that that's not a good way to enforce these regulations right having a, a part-time 16 year old kid um, determining who's going to get the products or not 
in the lawn care and the lawn maintenance side of things, we're seeing many, many people just taking their lawns completely out. So now where we used to have plants and areas for pollinators and <laughs> all those beneficial insects that we've been hearing about, now it's just rock. So the rock looks okay for a little while, but then the weeds start to grow in it as well. And then when it rains, none of the water is absorbed into that rock. It all runs off into our sewers, making it uh, you know, more expensive for cities and, and municipalities to handle all that water. Um, one of the things with these approved products is that they must be applied at much higher rates and we have to use them so, many, so much more often. So it, we're actually using a lot more pesticides with these products than we used to, right? The quantities are through the roof and uh, you have to use them over and over and over again to kind of get any kind of results that people are happy with. Um, one of the big things too is the lack of enforcement and we don't fault the province for this, but it's just basically impossible to enforce these rules. So businesses and homeowners are hiring maintenance companies that are breaking the law and applying traditional weed controls. The unlevel playing field that this has created is a huge disadvantage for legitimate lawn care companies who are applying approved products because of all the increased costs. Maintenance companies can now provide better results at a lower cost by choosing to break the law and it's severely hurt businesses who follow the rules. What used to be a well run industry, well regulated industry is now just a free for all out there. And uh, many companies have gone underground applying unapproved products for much less cost and getting better results. The, the big reason that companies are doing that is because there are very few cost effective alternatives. There's really only one from Newdorf, <laughs> who made a presentation earlier tonight. They have a lot to lose, I guess, if, if you know the markets opened up here because they are the only supplier and the cost of their products is extremely high. Believe me, I know. Um, there are limited tools. The, uh, the allowed list, you know, there's quite a few products on this allowed list, but for most of it, this, this regulation is about weed control on lawn. So we don't use glyphosate or Roundup or any of these products that have been mentioned earlier today. Um, those products kill everything. If it's green, it dies. So in the lawn care business and what homeowners are concerned about are getting rid of typically broadleaf weeds, the thistles, the dandelions, the plantain, that sort of thing that are polluting their lawns. That's what they want to get rid of. Nobody's using glyphosate on, on areas like that at all. I mean, it's not really an issue in the lawn care business. But most of these products that are allowed for use on lawns, as I said, kill all the plants. That, these are all these approved products, but really there's just one on the list that, that is uh, effective or somewhat effective on broadleaf weeds. And uh, the list has not been updated since 2014. And that's, one of the big things that this current regulations really inhibit any kind of development of new products because the manufacturers are going to look at it and say, okay, if it's not on the list, we can't sell it in Manitoba. We can't sell it in Ontario. Um, so there's no market. There's no uh, reason to go through any kind of registration cost with Health Canada, which typically would take you you know, 10 years, 15 to $20 million, I think is the number that is banded and thrown around to get a product to market now. So it costs a huge amount of money to do it. And if it's not on the approved list, there's no chance of selling it here in Manitoba. So there's no reason to go through it. So it really limits the amount of products that are coming down the pipe. Even if they are really low risk, really good products, no chance in Manitoba. So. We, we think, MBNLA really believes that the decision to rely on Health Canada Pest Management Regulatory Agency for science-based regulation is the way to go here. Uh, it's really the only logical choice. They're the experts. They make sure that the products are safe. I, we need to get Health Canada at this table here to justify and 
and, and defend themselves against the onslaught of uh, criticism that they've taken here. But I, I believe that their best interest is in making sure that, you know, the products are safe for Manitobans and for everybody in Canada. Pesticides are vital for our safe and healthy society. Um, as you're aware, pesticides are used throughout the country in many time, situations. Time has expired, Mr. Hinton. Thank you very much for your presentation. Does the committee have any questions for the presenter? Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Hinton, for uh, providing us the information tonight from Manitoba Nursery Landscape Association. Um, certainly, it's uh, this process and committee and everybody around the committee table uh, respect all our, uh, our presenters and uh, we need to hear uh, all sides of the issue and I uh, thank you for providing uh, the table tonight uh, uh, the other side of the issue as well and uh, certainly we respect both and uh, certainly this helps inform policy as we go forward so I appreciate the time. Mr. Hinton. You, any comments Mr. Hinton? No, okay. MLA Naylor. Thank you for your presentation. Um, one thing that you mentioned is that um, you network with other landscapers around the country. So can you tell me why maintenance companies from almost every BC municipality in all six provinces east of Manitoba are able to be successful despite strong pesticide bans, but Manitoba landscapers can't be successful with these same regulations? Why is that? Mr. Hinton. We're, we're using these restrictive products, or the, the approved products. Um, the cost is a lot more for homeowners to do that. We have to apply a lot more product. And, and everywhere, in all provinces, there's a lot of underground activity happening, right? So the, the, the enforcement is very difficult. And as legitimate companies are trying to do the right thing, use the right products, it's, it's very difficult to have you know, a landscaper with a backpack in his in his trailer offering to do it for half the price or a quarter of the price. MLA Gerard. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, just an extension of the last question. I mean, this is one jurisdiction where there's a lot of backpedaling from what the original legislation was. And uh, yet in other jurisdictions, uh, people have been able to manage with the legislation uh, without having all the problems that you're talking about. No, those problems... And, uh, Mr. Hinton. Those problems exist in all the other jurisdictions, absolutely. We were promised a made in Manitoba solution here in 2014. That did not really happen. We just copied, you know, basically the list from Ontario. The, the approved list was put together behind closed doors. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, they didn't really rely on Health Canada. Some of the products on that approved list are pretty dangerous. Um, skin burns, you know, it, they're not friendly products, but they're on that list. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how the list was put together, but uh, it, these problems are, are across the board. Like these are not, just Manitoba specific. Everywhere where this type of legislation has come in and they have ignored Health Canada, this is this is the result. Honourable Minister. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks again, Mr. Hinton. Uh, could you, uh, the legislation came in in 2014, can you provide us with a little bit more detail on some of the challenges? We've heard in a written statement from AMM tonight about some of the challenges they've had with the current uh, legislation. Could you provide the table uh, some more information, maybe a deeper dive, per se, on some of the challenges you've found in the past six years? Um, Mr. Hen, sorry. Sorry. So uh, further challenges, um, you know, the lack of public education is huge. Um, we were promised that, you know, there'd be a big rollout of, of information for the public out there, but really, most people are totally confused on what they can do, where they can buy products, you know, and, and to have all those phone calls coming into all the different lawn care companies' offices and everybody's trying to explain these rules, it, it's very difficult. It's painful um, trying to educate 
homeowners on what can be done, what should be done, you know, when you can use a product. It's okay to use it in your garden, but don't turn around 180 degrees and spray it on your lawn. That's against the law. Like, completely arbitrary rules like that are very difficult for the public to understand, and they just don't get it. They don't understand it, and, and they don't follow them. MLA Weave, there's less than 30 seconds. I, I appreciate that, and um, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Him, for your presentation. You know, I walk around the neighborhood, I see, uh, you know, not to pick out any companies in particular, but Lawn Man or Weed Man, signs all over, it look like really nice lawns. These are lawns that are being, um, having this current Fiesta Time product has expired. applied to them. Can I, can Sorry. I finish my question? Leave to uh, finish the question and comment? And have an answer. And you need to leave for the answer as well. That's fine. Okay. Agreed? Okay. <laughs> Follow the rules. Uh, leave for Mr. Weed to con conclude his question and leave sure for the, the minister. Min we're, uh, we're just asking the presenter a question. Um, so my question uh, simply is, you, you focused in on the fact that the list of approved products was frozen in 2014, as you put it. Uh, obviously, other jurisdictions are you know, doing this kind of similar legislation. Are other products out there, if we were to update that list at this point, would that make more sense? Again, you're, you know, it seems like in your industry, folks want to follow the rules. They want to do what's right and they want to produce nice lawns. So, Mr. Hinton, sorry, please. He needs to recognize yeah. Me. sorry. Yeah, for the broadleaf weed control in lawns, there is one. That's it. That's all there is. Uh, again, it has to be Health Canada approved, right? So, the, manufacturer has to go through that registration process and right now there is just one so um, yeah we get results with it it costs a lot of money and and there's a lot of pesticide application to get those results many reapplications and and the quantity that we have to apply to get those results is so much higher than with the traditional products thank you uh, time for questions has expired thank you mr. Hinton for your presentation I would call Josh Brandon, Social Planning Council of Winnipeg. He would go to the bottom of the list. Need to uh, go down the list. Uh, Josh is virtual. Oh, Josh is virtual. Okay, we're going to bring him out. We have Mr. Brandon there now. All right. Can we see and hear you well enough? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. When you're Thank you so much. When you're ready, please proceed, Mr. Brandon. Thank you for the opportunity to present here today on Bill 22, the Environment Amendment Act, Pesticide Restrictions. I'm presenting on behalf of the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg. We are a nonprofit organization for over 100 years. We've been working for better lives for Winnipeggers and Manitobans to build sustainable communities that are caring, just, and equitable. I'm presenting today because regulating non-essential uses of pesticides is an important way to build healthier lives and protect the environment we all share. In 2014, Manitoba instituted the existing legislation to reduce the use of cosmetic pesticides in Manitoba. The legislation restricted the use of pesticides for non-agricultural purposes on lawn and associated areas. At the time, polling by Probe Research found that 60% of Manitobans supported these restrictions. And at uh, Social Planning Council of Winnipeg, we supported that legislation also because of the risks to children and pets where they are most likely to be exposed. Lawns are areas where family members play. These are not areas where we should be applying potentially toxic pesticides. These uses also pose unnecessary risks to our environment, particularly our waterways. So why do we need restrictions on pesticides? The current ban represents sound science-based public policy. Independent peer-reviewed evidence has established that serious health risks are associated with human exposure to chemical pesticides. Assessments of pesticide health risks have been 
reported in four systemic analyses of peer-reviewed health studies, including one by the Ontario College of Family Physicians in 2012 that examined 142 studies, and another by the PEI Public Health Office in 2015 that reviewed 365 studies. This body of research indicates that health risks associated with exposure to pesticides includes a range of harmful impacts affecting adults, such as diabetes, cancer, neurological disorders, as well as adverse reproductive neurological development and respiratory outcomes that are particularly significant for children, pregnant women, and newborns. When cosmetic pesticides are a source of such exposure, these are preventable harms. The province-wide opinion poll in 2015 found a clear majority of respondents favored restricting non-essential uses of pesticides. Understandably, people want to live in healthy neighborhoods where they and their children are not exposed to avoidable pesticide health risks. In addition to human health benefits, restricting non-essential uses of pesticides helps protect the health of pests, reduce risks for pollinating insects, reduce, reduces pesticide contamination of waterways, and preserves biodiversity. We've heard uh, from the government about the baselines set by Health Canada. The baselines that Health Canada sets are minimum standards for the uses of pesticides. Nothing in Health Canada's regulations prevents provinces from intro introducing higher protections for their residents and constituents. In fact, the majority of provinces have done so. So the question each of you must ask yourself when considering this legislation, does Manitoba wish to be among the minority of jurisdictions that have reduced protections for your constituents to the federally regulated minimum? The bill we are considering today will unnecessarily weaken protections Manitobans depend on. In consideration of these points, we recommend that the bill to amend the Environment Act regarding pesticide restrictions be withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brandon, for your presentation. Uh, would members of the committee like to ask questions? Minister Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, if, if yourself and uh, the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg uh, don't agree with uh, the federal regulations, have have you and your group um, had success with presentations to modify Health Canada's approved list? Mr. Brandon. Thank you, Minister. I have had the opportunity to present on several occasions to Health Canada and the, uh, the PMRA um, about pesticide regulation. And we would welcome uh, changes in the review process that are underway. and. Uh, as uh, some of my colleagues before have noted, we, uh, we welcome the government of Manitobans' uh, efforts to improve those, those regulations, and we hope that they will uh, be presenting with us uh, to strengthen those regulations. But as I said, nothing will prevent uh, the province of Manitoba, nothing in current regulations prevents the province from introducing higher protections for residents and constituents. There have been a number of uh, uh, legal cases uh, starting at uh, uh, in the case of uh, Hudson, Quebec, uh, saying that municipalities have, have that right also. Provinces definitely have that right. And, uh, and that's why the majority of provinces have uh, regulations and standards that are higher than the federally regulated minimums. MLA Naylor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Josh, for being, oh, I'm gonna look at the camera instead of your face over there. Um, thank you for presenting here tonight. And um, I, I know that um, there was a press release, I believe back in the spring that your group did with a number of other organizations. What were some of the other organizations who have spoken out um, repeatedly against the changes to this legislation? Mr. Brandon. Thank you, uh, 
Ms. Naylor. Um, we, uh, we were in partnership with a coalition of 30 health and environmental organizations, uh, including uh, the Humane Society, uh, Green Action Centre, but also important health organizations like the uh, Canadian Cancer Society, the Lung Association. So this is a, a wide ranging coalition of, uh, of groups that recognize the harms to human health and the environment of allowing non-essential uses of pesticides. And uh, I hope that uh, the government listens to those experts about the, uh, the potential harms and risks of weakening existing regulations. MLA Gerard. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of the things that uh, the 30 groups that you're involved with have emphasized is the adverse effects on neurodevelopmental uh, aspects of children. I wonder if you would elaborate a little bit more on that. Mr. Brandon. Thank you for that question. Now, I think we all have children that are close to us uh, that we care about and uh, any risks of, uh, of neurological developments would be particularly concerning for all of us. Um, you know, I'm not uh, a scientist that could, or a, or a medical expert that can talk uh, specifically about uh, about what those neurological disorders are and, you know, but the, uh, uh, how they progress. But I know that any, uh, any risk in those areas would be a red flag for, for me and for, for everyone in, in our community, I think. Uh, there's, for the sake of having fewer dandelions in your yard, why would you put the health of children at risk, particularly when some of these uh, risks are are so concerning and uh, and disturbing. Are there any further questions? Thirty seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr. Brandon, for your presentation. Time has ex has expired. Yes. We go back to the top of the list and call the people that were called previously. Margaret Friesen, private citizen. Shirley Forsyth. Okay. Margaret Friesen will now be removed from the list. Shirley Forsyth, private citizen. Yep. Shirley Forsyth will be removed. No, 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 no. It's present virtual. Hmm? So, yes. Oh, virtual. Okay, sorry, my mistake. Uh, Shirley Friesen, private citizen, virtual. Forsyth. Forsyth, sorry. Shirley Forsyth. Moment to get online here. Can you unmute the microphone and turn your video on, Ms. Forsyth? We're not seeing anything yet. Oh. Oh. Oh my goodness. Okay. Can can you hear and see us? And can we hear you? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. I've never done this before. Um, it just doesn't prompted up to join, so I joined. It's okay. Been a very we are long now hearing you. So uh, when you're ready, please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, I don't have very much to say that hasn't already been said. It's been a lot of really excellent presentations. I live in the center of the city, so I'm really concerned about the fact that boulevards in a lot of the areas are the only areas that children have to play on, or, or adults are. We garden on the boulevards because there is a lack of green space. And I don't think that's been taken into consideration that um, the only green space that is available in sort of the many mature areas of the city exists on the boulevards and you could spray chemicals that potentially could be toxic. Um, 
I'm very concerned about this one. I'm a retired nurse. Um, many years ago, we had, I remember a young person coming into the emergency and I worked there. He'd uh, mixed up the pesticides wrong and he sort of died within a week. So it left a really, um, he was a farmer, a young farmer with a young family. So I know that these things can be very dangerous. And um, I worked for a while on with kids, children with leukemia and uh, lawn pesticides was thought to be a risk factor. And that kind of has, will stay with me for life. So I really just can't in good conscience support a law that would facilitate greater use of, facility, of pesticides and on green space that mostly you know, children have access to, such as the boulevards and which is not covered in this legislation. And I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Forsythe. Does the committee have any questions for the presenter? Honorable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, thank you, Mrs. Forsythe, for taking the time uh, to and and stay stay on for the last couple of hours to to uh, uh, provide some information to the table. Certainly appreciate that, and uh, and thank you again for for sharing some of those real personal points uh, that uh, you shared with the table as well. As a father of two and a grandfather of five. I certainly, uh, certainly respect uh, the fact that we have to protect our children, protect our families, and protect our pets as well. And, and that's why Bill 22 will, will be strengthened again to ensure that Overtime. playgrounds Overtime. and schools and, and daycare centers uh, and dog parks and picnic areas will be protected uh, yeah. from cosmetic pesticide. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Forsythe, did you have any comments? Concerned about the boulevards and the mature areas of the city were children play on the boulevards because they may not have front lawns. MLA Naylor. Thank you very much for your presentation and for the personal stories that you shared. I really appreciate your focus on boulevards coming from work, living in the inner city and being, you know, seeing that that is a place, you know, certainly where people play, where children play, also where dogs play. I, I keep hearing the minister reference dog parks, but in reality, the majority of dogs walk on the boulevards um, and that that's what families do so i really appreciate your point on that and also reminding us that many many manitobans don't have the luxury of a big place to play and the boulevards are essential over time miss Forsyth, do you have any questions uh no just thank you for listening to me mla gerard yeah i i wonder if you would talk about other areas where children play that it would be important to protect because there's a lot of areas where children play that uh, are not now being protected. Ms. Forsyth. Oh, sorry. Kids will migrate to any green space. And like I said, a lot of these mature centers like empty lots or if they're, they can find one any place where they still can find a place to throw a ball or a frisbee or whatever is in style right now. Kids just need and play with their dogs, run with their dogs, get some exercise. It's just really important that these green spaces be kept as safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Forsyth? Thank you very much, Ms. Forsyth, for your presentation. Moving down the list. I will call Al Mackling, private citizen. I, no. I will call Steve Ra, uh, who has a virtual presentation, I understand. Yeah. Can you turn your video on and unmute, Mr. Earl? We're seeing nothing yet. Can you see and hear us? I can see and hear you. Uh, yes, and we can hear I, you. So when you're comfortable, Mr. Roth. I, I, uh, yeah. Sorry about this. There's a power outage uh, in oh. the Riverview neighborhood. 
And so I've been so I'm trying Mr. to connect Rob, this. Please go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just make a quick, simple presentation. Um, uh, the um, uh, bill that was passed that uh, restricted the use of pesticides uh, changed my life a little bit. Um, this is uh, Pulmacor. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Bricanel. This is a uh, asthma medicine that I use when I get a severe attack and I want quick relief. And this is uh, Pulmacort. This is an asthma medicine that the doctors have told me if I have sustained asthma, which means if I use this more than two or three times a week, I'm to take the Pulmacort daily, twice daily, uh, to keep my lungs from getting scarred. Uh, the, the please, recent Rob, study please do not use props. We can't really put them in the record. If you can speak it in, please do so. Okay. Well, I'm just showing you. Uh, Mr. Ra, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the recent studies on Palmacourt show that it causes a problem with the brain as do uh, some the use of steroids, which has now been identified as brain fog. And uh, or um, so the recent recommendation is to use as little of it as possible. So my choice is to use one or the other when I get asthma. But what would be best is that I not get asthma. Prior to the passage of the uh, pesticide uh, reduction, uh, cosmetic pesticide reduction bill of 2014, uh, 2008, 2014, whenever it was, um, I would ride my bike around the city and people would have uh, their lawns signs on and it would show that there had been uh, pesticides sprayed on their lawn and I would get pretty serious asthma attacks. Uh, subsequent to its passage and uh, the re uh, tremendous reduction in the use of the pesticide, I can ride my bike anywhere in the city and not get an asthma attack. And so during the summer, when I love being outside, uh, I can be around, go around and not get any asthma. And all summer long, I have not had to use medicine. If, that, if you pass the pesticide, uh, rescind the pesticide act, that's gonna change my experience of Winnipeg. I'm gonna be asthmatic all year round and um, that will harm my health. And um, I'm sure I'm not unique in this, and I'm not a child, I can manage my asthma, but I know children who have a very difficult time managing their asthma. So I recommend that you not rescind this bill, that it has led to a considerable improvement in the quality of health, especially and this is the reason the Lung Association, I'm sure, supports the current ban on cosmetic pesticides. And uh, that, that is just one example of a, a not, I'm not talking about cancer or neurological disorders. Those are much more difficult medical problems. But one example of the benefit that has uh, accrued for me personally, and I'm sure for many, many other people who have asthma. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Ra. Are there any questions from the committee for the presenter? Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Ra, and uh, thank you for sharing uh, your story and uh, some of the challenges you're having, and certainly appreciate that. That's uh, one of the reasons why we hold these committees, and they're a great uh, sh uh, opportunity for the democratic process to move forward. Um, I don't have any comment other than uh, I hope your power comes on again soon and uh, please stay well. Mr. Ra, did you have any comment? Ms. Ms. Um, well, the, the, uh, the um, protection of health um, is not just a question of majority versus minority. Health protection needs to be done uh, for pretty much everybody. And it's the reason that we um, have uh, laws that show us uh, that that require us to drive a car in the right way. And it ought to be the reason we have laws that require us to minimize the dangers 
to the people who are sometimes in a minority when it comes to their health. This is not a, about a democratic process. This is about a process, a community process that ensures health and well-being for everybody. Ms. Naylor. Much for your comments, no, no, Mr. Ra. Um, I I appreciate hearing. I mean, I, I'm well aware of the long-term health risks with exposure to some of these pesticides and herbicides. But hearing your very immediate um, response, positive response to the legislation change is helpful. Can you elaborate? Has there been a reduction in visits to the doctor? Or other um, medical costs to the province, like any specific reduction just from, from you having reduced incidences of asthma? Mr. Ra. Uh, like I said, um, I'm, a, I'm now 73, <laughs> so I've been around a while, and I've been able to manage uh, my health. But yes, I have had a few more visits to the doctor when my asthma has gotten worse. Uh, my personal cost and the cost of the health system and the insurance system has gone up because I've had to use more medicine previous to the Pesticide uh, Reduction Act. Um, and uh, so I'm going to guess that um, it is costing the health system, especially when we're talking about young people of asthma. And asthma seems to be on the increase in recent years in the recent decades, I should say, rather than the decrease. It's, a, it's an issue that, a health issue that we know how to manage, not cure. And there are a lot of other issues that we're having uh, difficulty managing, like ADD and ADHD, which are some of the neurological conditions that have been associated with the uses of pesticides. Emily Gerard. Thank you for your presentation and uh, for a very clear illustration of the impact of the law which was passed in 2014 to ban uh, cosmetic pesticide use. And, and a noticeable impact on your health. So uh, thank you very much for your story and uh, because it illustrates uh, quite clearly the difference before and after the previous legislation was passed. Mr. Ra. Uh, yeah, I would, I would it, it is a noticeable impact on my health. Um, if anyone uh, in the room would like to hold their breath for two minutes and then tell me how they feel, um, you can get an idea what it's like to have asthma because sometimes for hours you have a very hard time breathing. And uh, there's a famous uh, psychiatrist named Sullivan who put loss of breath at the top of any form of anxiety that a person can have. Because you can go without water for days, but you can't go without breath for more than several minutes. So asthma is a particularly difficult uh, health issue to manage. And if we're going to increase uh, the uh, incidence of asthma through the use of cosmetic pesticides in a city that has currently for the last several years been able to reduce that problem, I think we're moving in the wrong direction. Does it, thank you. Does the committee have any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Ra, for your presentation. We'll return to calling uh, any further members that were uh, called before and not, not available. Um, Troy B. Bailey, private citizen. No, nope. so, he, he's dropped off the bottom of the list then. Okay, so start reading your second one. Okay. During the meeting, we have received written submissions from Meg Sears, uh, Prevent Cancer Now, and from uh, Randall McQuaker, Private Citizen. Does the committee agree to have these documents appear in the Hansard transcript of the meeting? Agreed. Agreed, and so ordered being circulated. This concludes the list of presenters we have before us. Is there anyone present in the room wishing to make a presentation? Seeing none, we will now proceed to the clause by clause. Thank you to all of the presenters for your time and your patience this evening.
Yo me dice algo. Does the minister res uh, responsible for Bill 22 have an opening statement? Honorable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be here tonight. And uh, Bill 22, the Environment uh, Amendment Act uh, in committee, and uh, certainly was a, uh, a great evening for, uh, for, for the table. And I, I appreciate all the presenters that were here. Thank you uh, again for all those that, that presented to Bill 22. Bill 22 will amend the Environment Act to allow Manitobans to use federally approved cosmetic pesticides on their lawns. At the same time, the bill enhances protections for children and pets. We heard from Manitobans, the current legislation is not working. Manitobans want to be able to use products that are already approved through Health Canada's robust scientific approval process. The current available products in Manitoba are expensive and not effective. Repeat treatments are needed to have, many, to have any impact whatsoever. Households and municipalities have little to show for these efforts except extra costs. Green spaces have become overrun with weeds. This affects use and limits recreation opportunities in our province. Instead, the bill gives Manitobans choice. Manitobans are free to use products. They know Health Canada has thoroughly reviewed to ensure they are safe. Our government is committed to science-based decisions. We know Health Canada are the experts on pesticides. Health Canada thoroughly reviews pesticides and deems them safe when used according to the label. The label has easy to follow directions to increase safe handling, including personal protective equipment, surface water setbacks, and apl application timing and amount. Over 350 scientists are dedicated to review of the review of pesticides. They use the most recent data and science available to assess risks to human health and the environment. Any pesticide must go through this review before it can be sold in Manitoba. Out of an abundance of caution, the bill will restrict use in municipal playgrounds, picnic areas, dog parks, and provincial parks. Pesticides will use will pesticides use use will remain restricted at schools, child care centers, and hospitals. Permits will still be required to use to use pesticides in golf courses, parks, and campgrounds that are used by the general public. These permits have conditions that uh, ensure safe pesticide use and protect communities, such as the need to use licensed pesticide applicators. Licensed applicators must meet national certification standards. They are trained to apply products correctly to reduce risks to Manitobans. Our government has done more to protect people than any other in the prairie provinces. Our our prairie neighbors have no ban on cosmetic pesticides and do not protect sensitive areas. I am confident that this is a safe and responsible approach Manitobans have told us they want. Thank you, Messi Megwich. Thank you, Minister. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Ms. Naylor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill amends the Environment Act to remove the prohibition on applying certain pesticides to lawns, as well as remove the provincial regulation on the sale of those pesticides. This legislation is a disappointing step back regarding the health and safety of our communities and environment. Bill 22 allows for the return of environmentally damaging and dangerous cosmetic pesticides, which the previous NDP government prohibited for use on lawns across Manitoba to keep communities safe. Bill 22 is deeply concerning for the health and well being of our children, pets, and anyone who uses green spaces. Many Manitobans have long advocated for fewer chemicals in our water, on our land, and in our air. And it is disheartening to see that Manitoba is the only jurisdiction in Canada going backwards on this issue. Rolling back legislation that protected our environment does not advance our fight against climate change, our fight for improved health care, and it's certainly, it's certainly those points have been made clear to this committee tonight um, by community members. 
I also um, would like to disagree with the minister's comment on comments on two points: the claims of enhanced protection for children and pets. Uh, this this legislation does not do that, and as we've heard multiple times tonight, Health Canada has never deemed any pesticide as safe, but rather as what is an acceptable risk. I'd like to thank any and all presenters that were here tonight who contributed their voices and perspectives by speaking to this important issue and contributing to the democratic process. And I especially appreciate folks who have um, shared some of their own personal health experiences in relation to pesticide use. So thank you. We thank the member. During the consideration of the bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Also, is there agreement from the committee, with agreement from the committee, the chair will call clauses and blocks that conform to pages with the understanding that we will stop at any particular clause or clauses which members may have comments, questions, or amendments to propose. Agreed. Uh, agreed? That's so ordered. Clause by clause, shall clauses one through three pass? Clauses one through three accordingly pass. Shall clauses four through ten pass? Clauses four through ten accordingly pass. Shall the enacting clause pass? Pass. The enacting clause is accordingly pass. Shall the title pass? The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed, the bill will be reported. The hour being 8.33, is the business of the committee concluded? What is the will of the committee? Rise. What, what is the will of the committee? The committee rise. The committee rise. Thank you.